Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the monthly clinical meeting that is conducted in collaboration between Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. And uh, this will be the last monthly clinical meeting for this year. And uh, this will be focusing on mainly on industrial lung diseases. And uh, we have three eminent and experts resource persons representing the College of Pulmonologists of Sri Lanka. And the first speaker will be Dr. Asha Samaranayaka, who is a consultant respiratory physician from the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And uh, she will be discussing interstitial lung diseases and connective tissue disorders. Dr. Asha Samaranayaka. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Indika Karnaratna, for that kind introduction. So I would like to start today discussion. Mm -hmm. My topic I coin as what to know and what to do about connective tissues disease related ILD. I will in my presentation I will go through these subheadings. A brief, brief introduction touching few basics and burden. Then we'll to see going to see what to know about old and new subgrouping classifications patterns adapted from idiopathic counterparts, novel phenotyping and subclasses, novel disease behavior classification, which is again adapted from idiopathic counterparts and therapeutic advances with available evidence. And before summing up, we, we will move to see what to do in providing standard care with practical management algorithm. I would like to introduce connective tissue disease related ILD as a heterogeneous group of disorders from its origin. As is a result of by union of heterogeneous components, namely connective tissue disease and interstitial lung disease. There will be mutual burden by action of these doors. And there will be a mutual burden by action of Duos on upon each other. And when we are moving to see what is the epidemiology behind connective tissue disease related ILD, the exact incidence and prevalence of this field is unknown, but it's said to be increasing. Generally, connective tissue disease is reported to be present in about 15% patient, patients with ILD population. However, when it comes to radiological prevalence, can be varied according to the uh, classification criteria and availability of imaging. It can vary from 33% to 57%, and it is variable across the countries. Up until recent, the evidence for this field of medicine was minimum or lacking. The most of the insight coming from recently published data on systemic stereosis ILD studies. For the interest sake to give an insight about disease burden, I would like to sum up a, such a study in next few minutes. This study is term Sensix, which was published in May 2019 they analyze a cohort of 560 patients from 32 countries having systemic sclerosis. And they found a few interesting findings there. When the patients develop pulmonary involvement, it was within first three years of diagnosis in about a quarter of patients. And when this pulmonary involvement was interstitial lung disease, it was the driving killer, killing about one third of them. I would like to state connective tissue disease related ILD as an unique disease entity. However, there are several factors making it difficult to diagnose or challenge at diagnosis and as well as management. Firstly, as I mentioned already, it's a heterogeneous by means of outset, 
courses, clinical courses and treatment. And there are sometimes significant inconsistencies seen among biomarker levels, severity of extrathoracic and intrathoracic manifestations. Adding, adding to this, the relative lack of guidelines and also lack of treatment protocols make this disease a challenging manage and management too. Then we'll move to see what are new and old things about classifications, which all one are still using. Therefore, I thought of just mentioning subgrouping, which is according to the underlying CTD, and also depend on histopathological and radiological patterns that you can counterparts are still in use. Subgrouping of CTD ILDs according to the underlying connective tissue disease. It seems like it's very easy task. However, remember, because of the different or uh, variable clinical presentations by the connective tissue disease, they can have variable degree of maturation, timing, and also sometimes they can have significant overlaps among each other, making this subclassification difficult. It is the same reason CTD-ILD definition is a difficult definition. When try to define, typically it can be defined as a progressive lung parenchymal manifestation of a well-defined connective tissue disease and present with respiratory symptoms. But this to happen, there should be concurrent well-matured connective tissue disease in the background, but it is not the case always. It can be an evolving CTD in the background, or there can be preceding CTD uh, with long lags sometimes, many years sometimes, and it could be the sole manifestation of a isolated or isolated pulmonary involvement of otherwise occult connective tissue disease. For these reasons, there were attempted other classifications according to the behavior of underlying connective tissue disease. Some diagnostic criteria were laid by the experts. And in 2015, the European Respiratory Society, ERS and American Thoracic Society, had coined a new entity called Interstitial Pneumonia Associated Ottoman Features. They proposed classification criteria for the, this with three, three domains. They are clinical domain, serological domain, and morphologic domain. To make the diagnosis, at least one from two different domains are needed. And with the, after that, the behavior of this uh, disease entity shows unique features. And then we'll see the radiological and histopathological patterns. They are, we utilize the same radiological, histological patterns similar to idiopathic counterpart. So they are namely usual interstitial pneumonia, few words on that. It's the commonest uh, ILD pattern seen in rheumatoid arthritis. And there are inclusion criteria radiologically as well as exclusion criteria to make the diagnosis. And some expert opinion is giving that they, there are some differences between idiopathic counterpart and when it comes to the connective tissue disease related ILD UIP pattern. In the diagnosis of most of the ILDs, not only UIP, the gold standard investigation is mostly imaging now due to many reasons. Firstly, the availability of advanced imaging techniques with good sensitivity and also availability of that. And the other way, there is a risk of uh, adding comorbidity and com mortalities to the underlying disease if you attempt more invasive approach like transbronchial biopsies, keyhole surgery, wet surgery biopsies, open lung biopsies. 
Therefore, lung biopsies and the histologies are minimally utilized. However, when it comes to this background, always we need to have expert opinion from a radiologist, and that is with the MDTM input. If there are controversial issues like difficult definitive diagnosis, sometimes may we still go into surgical lung biopsies and hence the histology. Usually the histology is limited to less than 10%. 10 See, uh, UIP pattern is the commonest or predominant pattern in rheumatoid arthritis. And there are pathognomic features. The hallmark is uh, honeycombing. To say there is definitive honeycombing, there should be more than three sheets of cyst at one point, and the, their distribution is characteristic with cephalocaudal predilection where the basal predominant will be seen, and also uh, there will be re associated reticular abnormalities, and also this subdural subdiaphragmatic location is pathognomic. And there are certain exclusion criteria like too much nodules, ground glass opacities, which uh, may think of other alternative diagnosis other than UIP. So when it comes to the second radiological pattern or the histopathological pattern is non-specific interstitial pneumonia. It is the pattern of ILD, which is seen across all the connective tissue disorders apart from rheumatoid arthritis. And they will have pathognomic distribution, usually a symmetrical disease with peripheral rim sparing and extreme basis sparing is seen. And very important to know there are three subclassifications in the NSIP group. That depends on the degree of cellularity and fibrosis. This concept of different cellularity and fibrosis is important in understanding the phenotype which I'm going to describe in the next few slides. Therefore, I'm just showing them. When there are cellular means a lot of inflammatory cells, the imaging will be ground glass opacities. And we can appreciate in this axial view of HRCT that there is a peripheral limb sparing, extreme basal sparing, and ground glass opacities in the defined area. And this is an illustration for fibrocellular NSIP. If you can appreciate, there are peribronchial fibrosis with the intervening ground glass opacities, showing both reticulation and ground glass. Then it comes to fibrous NSIP. And very important to note that the distribution of disease is shown in the corner section of the uh, HRCT other than axial. And as there is a radi radiological mimic closely resembling in SAP's hypersensitive pneumonitis, most of the time expert opinions needed to diagnose this disease. And there are a lot of causes even in CTD background. It can happen with the drug-induced form as well in the same background. Therefore, expert opinion is needed to diagnose this disease. And acute interstitial pneumonia is also uh, can be associated with connective tissue disease background. When it comes to organizing pneumonia, again, even with established connective tissue background, one should exclude other causes like drug induced and infections. This pattern is depicting two things. One is peribronchial consolidation and patchy consolidation nature. And this is an illustration of crazy previewing appearance in diffuse allular hemorrhage, which can be associated with certain connective tissue diseases. And this is just a table illustrating the pattern of ILDs across the different CTDs. And also remember that 
not only the interstitial is involved in sometimes simultaneously there can be airway pleura and pulmonary hypertension or muscle involvement in the same time then we are moving to describe about a very important thing <laughs> And when studying the behavior of certain ILD subclasses, it was found that uh, certain subclasses of ILD which are having fibrosis seems to be having sustained progressive fibrosis. This is despite optimum immune suppression therapies. This has led to understanding of a different phenotype among whole ILD subclasses, which is called progressive pulmonary fibrosing sub, uh, phenotype. And before we move into that, we we'll see few things about pathological differences. Now they think that, the experts think, there are two distinctive pathological mechanisms operate between non-fibrotic ILDs and fibrotic ILDs. In the fibrotic ILD, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and fibrotic other classes also included. And they are the pathology behind this. Once the epithelial injury happens, immune cascade goes for the commonly. However, when the vascular endothelial fibrillas differentiate and proliferate, they will eventually differentiate to myofibroblasts. And then this myofibroblasts will perpetuate fibrosis in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And they think this entity as primary progressive disease, primary progressive fibrosis. This behavior is in, uh, shown by uh, when checking the response to the immune modulators or immune therapies. As we know, these subclasses are poorly responding to immune suppression. Whereas non-fibrotic subclasses showing response to immune suppression. So they postulated that in non-fibrotic ILDs, there is ongoing active inflammation. Whereas fibrotic ILDs, including idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this process may have started from immune cells, but there is a self-perpetuation of the disease going on with progressive fibrosis up until the death. So this difference is very important to understand in the modern, uh, providing the modern care to whole sub ILD subclasses. So this phenotype is called progressive pulmonary fibrosing phenotype. Now, to further clarify this, the whole of the ILD can be divided into two categories of classifications. IPF, non-IPF in the other hand, and fibrotic can, non-fibrotic ILDs. This is an interesting Venn diagram drone reflecting the prevalence uh, of each ILD subclasses. And you can appreciate that there are significant overlaps among subclasses of ILD as well as when considering single ILD subclass, they can go across all three zones. What are the three zones? If you depict fibrotic ILD in this circle, eventually the center is taken by the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and rim is taken by non-fibrotic ILD. As we saw an uh, illustration, we'll go for NSIP. In the NSIP group, there will be people who are having non-fibrotic stage, that is cellular NSIP, and they can have fibrocellular and fibrous element and this is behavior sometimes is progressive fibrosis. So it's the same thing to the other, our topic, connective tissue disease, ILD and interstitial pneumonia associated uh, autoimmune features. 
So further clarifying this phenotypic phenomena of progressive fibrosis can be demonstrated here as considering the fibrotic ILD groups, there are people who are having stable fibrosis as well as progressive primary fibrosing phenotypes. Little complex, but if you understand this, our life is going to be easy in the future. So this concept of novel phenotyping has brought new insight to understanding the clinical behavior across the ILD subclasses. It can be applied to a variety of fibrotic ILDs despite important differences among distinct sub ILD subclasses, although they often have overlapping morphological features and common pathological mechanisms. Recent evidence has supported this concept by suggesting some shared biological mechanisms and greater overlap in the treatment options compared to the historical approaches. Then we'll move to see quickly some evidence to support antifibrotic therapy in CTDID subclass. There are three patient case series and subgroup analysis of inbuilt trial as well as they have studied post vital capacity changes in SENSIX trial. I'll just brief through. And this is the case series they were talking about in this group of cohort, three patients. They were diagnosed of having systemic sclerosis and one with progressive systemic sclerosis. And they were offered optimum treatment with immunvalidators like this. And they have seen that these three patients, despite optimum therapy, was downgrading. Then they offered them two of them, Nintanib and other perfendone, and they uh, look at some primary endpoints, that is dyspnea scale, post vital capacity, and DSO. And they conclude that after starting antifibrotics for six to 12 months, they have attained stability. So it's a significant finding. Though the power of the study is limited to three, sample number three, this shows the insight to the future studies. Then very important and interesting study that is inbuilt study is by, is a passivo double blind randomized control study. We are, Patients with progressive fibrosing ingestion lung disease was offered nintenonib. There are subgroup analysis, five subgroups. I didn't uh, mention the other four, including autoimmune ILDs, shows when compared to placebo, the nintenonib group was showing reducing rate of post vital capacity decline, which was consistent across all five groups. So it was a significant study. But the study was not powered to give the, publish this as a significant because it's a subgroup analysis. Then the last uh, trial regarding that is the Sensix trial. Yeah, they have given. It's a placebo uh, control uh, intervention study again. And they are the number of cases in the placebo and both in the group were similar at the beginning and with similar, almost similar baseline of post vital capacity. And after treatment with Nintanilib, there was a comparison made about how the post vital capacity is behaving, both in absolute and relative way, with the degree of more than five and more than 10. The statistically significant p-values obtained in these points that to conclude uh, when in systemic stress ILD, treatment with Nintendo associated with lower probability of more than 5% decline in force vital capacity over the study period of 52 weeks compared to placebo. So this shows 
future and then we'll see there are studies going on to see whether there are any uh, safety and efficiency about combining immune modulator plus antifibrotics. Seven patient case series is showing promising outcome. These patients were treated with low dose cyclophosphide and perfinidone. And they were showing promising results. And two other randomized controls science are still underway. So, but they show promising results. And in fact, they are using full dose for this study. And then we'll go for, this is behavior uh, management. This is behavior related management. So when you are going to this, I just got a literature survey and found an interesting article. Therefore I have just written down a guideline, a flow chart. Really speaking, still we, we are lacking proper guidelines on this issue, but we have, a promising future and hopes. Just briefly going through, when you diagnose or suspect connective tissue disease related ILD, the diagnosis is demanded to have a multidisciplinary team input, which is the gold standard recommendation. And always patient needs monitoring, at clinical parameters as well as dynamic lung function tests, which my colleague is going to mention about and serial imaging with comparison. During the diagnosis as well as monitoring and follow-up, multidisciplinary team care, care, shared care is demanded. So they have divided into six categories, self-limiting, where the aim is to have reversibility, may plus or minus immune suppression in this category. And there are other categories with reversible risk of progression. The aim is to have a reversibility. Examples are several organizing pneumonia, NSCFP, diffuse cell hemorrhage, and so on. They are uh, the, to have the reversibility. We can intensify the treatment with pulse steroids, immune suppression, plus or minus rituximab. And in chronic diseases with uh, organizing pneumonia, NSCIP pattern, we have to achieve stability with treatment. And stable disease, sometimes we may not treat, but monitor. And if they go into progression, the future is opening up to give combined therapy therapies. Because of the time limitation, I'm not going to read. Anyway, I can share my slides to you for the people who are interested in. And also, finally, I would like to state that connective tissue disease related IED is a field where with emerging evidence of treatment efficiency and safety. So future guidelines are yet to come. And they have stressed that a, B, C, D approach should be there for the people, patients with this disease from the beginning. They are access, backing, comorbidities, disease modifying treatment and end of life care. Multidisciplinary team approach is the gold standard. And in summary, recent international expert efforts on classification and novel disease behavior phenotyping with advancing diagnostics and monitoring facilities, evolving evidence for safety and efficiency on advanced therapeutics, collaborative use of shared multidisciplinary care pathways, also combined with early pulmonary rehabilitation with developing palliative care facilities, there will be a promising future expected in this field of misery. Hope for the proper management guidelines and to improve quality of life to the affected. Thank you very much for the patience listening. Thank you, Dr. Asham Rayaka. And uh, now we'll be moving into the case histories and it will be presented by Dr. LBN Chandramal, who is a senior registrar in respiratory medicine of the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Over to Dr. Chandramal. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Ceylon College of Palmologists for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so today uh, I am going to present a, a challenging case, both in the diagnostic and therapeutic aspect, uh, which is uh, having an inflammatory myositis associated with the interstitial lung disease. So the patient, uh, she's a 51-year-old nursing officer from Marvanella and uh, she doesn't have any significant past medical illnesses uh, up to uh, last year of duration. And in the timeline, uh, for one year duration, she experienced a generalized malaise with on and off difficulty to climb, climb stairs, but there's no other upper limb involvement or muscle or joint pains. And she didn't have any loss of appetite or loss of weight. But she managed to uh, attend her uh, normal day-to-day -day activities with these symptoms. But, uh, and she has taken uh, treatments uh, on and off with, and treated with antibiotics for, for suspecting infection, but not extensively investigated. But uh, in three months back, uh, then she experienced a moderate degree of fever with chills, and it is, uh, which is intermittent na nature. But uh, there's no symptoms towards any upper or lower respiratory tract infections, UTI or any gastrointestinal symptoms, no features of connective tissue disorders, no night sweats, or no any uh, high risk sexual behavior or any uh, chronic exposures. Uh, so uh, she was seen by a nearby tertiary care center and uh, uh, because of this fever and long standing constitutional symptoms, uh, she was evaluated for pyrexia of unknown origin. Uh, but at that time, also clinical examination was unremarkable. And but in the investigations, uh, they found to have uh, that the patient having some uh, recursive uh, antibodies, uh, IgG strongly positive. So they think of patient having a recursive infection, and they have treated with IV chlorampenicol. But uh, patient didn't show any. So uh, these are the uh, investigations uh, done by the. Uh, first encounter, where in the full blood count, there is some uh, low normal leukocyte counts with some mild anemia and blood picture showing uh, some uh, features of infection and inflammation with some iron deficiency anemia. And there are some high inflammatory markers with ESR and CRP. And initial imaging, including chest texture is normal uh, and septic screening, TB screening and renal liver profiles are normal. Uh, and 2D echo, uh, exclude uh, uh, infective endocarditis. Uh, she has normal CPK values, but LDH is on high side. So thinking of, uh, so, but clinical, there's no any uh, lymphadenopathy or organopathy. So uh, they proceed with the bone marrow, which is normal. Uh, and uh, most of the investigations done was normal. And then uh, they think of some paraneoplastic manifestation with this symptom. So they proceed with the CECT series, including CECT brain, and uh, didn't show any evidence of malignancy. But uh, patient doesn't show any response. So then two months back, uh, she was uh, found to have any ANE is positive. It was very strongly positive with one in thousand liters. And, uh, but she doesn't have any uh, clinical features uh, towards uh, any, uh, to diagnose any connective tissue disorders, but they have started steroids along with the hydroxychloroquine uh, with the provisional diagnosis of SLE. Uh, but uh, the, fortunately, patient was respond well to these steroids and symptoms has improved. But while tailing off the steroids, that is two weeks back to uh, the second encounter, uh, the symptoms has recurred. And this time, patient uh, experienced a progressive exertional dyspnea with the MMRC grade 3, but without other respiratory symptoms. And with these symptoms, she has admitted to the NHSL and on the admission, uh, acute cardiac events uh, and evidence of cardiac failure is excluded. So this is a, a fever pattern at NHSL. So you can see there is some intermittent type fever pattern uh, with uh, intensity of 100 to 101 degrees. So in general examination in the second encounter also, it's unremarkable and uh, there's no features towards any connective tissue disorders uh, and only having some bilateral mild uh, ankle edema. Uh, in respiratory examination, she is mildly tachypneic and uh, saturation on resting, uh, it was around 89 to 90. 
and she is significantly desaturated even with a minimum exertion up to 82 but lungs are clear and uh, in the other uh, respiratory system examination findings are unremarkable so uh, both uh, cvs and abdominal examinations are normal and uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system examinations are normal but and uh, we couldn't appreciate any uh, proximal myopathy or muscle tenderness so but uh, by looking at a x-ray uh, so there is some uh, ground glass appearance mainly uh, involving uh, uh, bilateral mid and lower zones uh, uh, but uh, there is some slight uh, peripheral sparring so uh, there is some definite respiratory system involvement so now uh, we have a diagnostic challenge so uh, so what can be the cause for this uh, presentation so uh, patient who is suspecting a connective tissue disorder uh, may be a evolving disease with on steroid for now two months duration present with the respiratory symptoms so uh, this can be a uh, community acquired but most probably opportunistic infection so this can be a atypical presentation of a pulmonary tb or a uh, high chance of having a pneumocystis pneumonia or this can be again a fungal or viral pneumonia but the other possibilities uh, this can be a pulmonary manifestation of a evolving connective tissue disease anyway she was not on any offending drugs for uh, having a drug induced pneumonitis and a previous CT series done and it was negative. So the third and fourth uh, differentials are less likely. So uh, we have uh, planned our next investigations according to these differentials. In the second encounter also, uh, uh, the basic investigation showing high inflammatory markers and the, for the second time also septic screening and TB evaluation is normal. And ABG showing a type one respiratory failure with the PO2 of 55 millimeter mercury. So uh, the next investigations, we have planned bronchoscopy with uh, bronchial lavage and HRCT uh, while uh, we are evaluating this patient for connective tissue disorder. And uh, we have started oxygen therapy and uh, with uh, broad spectrum antibiotic empirically until the cultures are available. And uh, as the patient had a background history of uh, 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 immunosuppression with exertional desaturation, clear lungs, with some uh, low uh, cell counts and high LDH. Uh, so there is a possibility of having a PCP pneumonia with that uh, chest X-ray. So uh, empirically, until the reports available, we have started a cotrium therapeutic dose with the steroid cover. And uh, with the treatment, uh, his uh, her fever, malice has improved. And along with the, uh, there is some significant improvement in the exertional desaturation. But unfortunately, again, symptoms uh, reappeared and there was some worsening of radiological features while tailing off the steroids again. So this is the, uh, the first and the second chest x-ray. The first x-ray I have uh, showed to you before. And you can appreciate that there is some worsening of ground glass appearance uh, compared to the first chest x-ray. And then the HRCT was available and there is an extensive bilateral ground glass appearance and uh, the radiologist commented as the, the extreme peripheries and bases are somewhat spared, but there is some widespread involvement. So the differentials are still this can be a PCP, but there's poor response to the PCP treatment. And the second one is this can be a uh, NSIP. So uh, we move to our next investigation. So the pro procalcitonin also doesn't favor for the infection. And the bronchoscopy, which was a normal study, there's no hemorrhage. And all the uh, sampling done and all the uh, gene expert, fungal, PCP ciliar stain, galactomenon are not favor of any infective focus. And cytology also negative for malignant cells. But because of this uh, high, strongly positive ANA and the, uh, the patient having some uh, prox clinically uh, having some proximal uh, myopathy with the evidence with some uh, difficulty to climbing stairs on and off. And she has uh, given a significant history. So proceed with the uh, EMG and it's showing some evidence of myositis, uh, including both lower and upper limbs, but there is significant uh, involvement in the lower limbs. 
and with that we proceed with the muscle biopsy and uh, there are some focal perifascular atrophy and endomyelial lymphocyte uh, infiltrations and they concluded this as a is a risolin type inflammatory myopathy but this focal perifascular atrophy is a very strongly suggestive towards a dermatomyositis so uh, this looks like a patient with a dermatomyositis with a interstitial lung disease so uh, in the autoimmune panel uh, uh, the almost all the available autoimmune screening was negative uh, except the ene and including the anti jo1 which also negative so in the uh, first uh, multidisciplinary meeting uh, so uh, we will uh, we have discussed uh, this with the presence of physicians respiratory physicians rheumatologists and the radiologists and uh, we decided uh, to diagnose this case as the evolving connective tissue disorder with the uh, pulmonary involvement with the nsip and we plan to increase the immunosuppression but uh, we have few questions but as this is uh, named as a dermatomyositis but there is no cutaneous manifestations and there is no clinically detectable myopathy so i would like to explain this in my next few, few slides so in this patient we have started iv methylprednisolone pulses uh, followed with the oral prednisolone and uh, as there is some extensive radiological in, uh, involvement uh, we have started the second agent as a cyclosporin and we monitor the patient with the clinical and physiological and radiological parameters so uh, i would like to uh, hold the case uh, for a while uh, and would like to go for some theoretical as uh, theory aspect uh, so uh, so this patient now present with nsip so uh, as asha madam uh, described that nsip also one entity of a, uh, interstitial lung disease so this can be either primary as idiopathy or it can be secondary to a hiv infection or connective tissue disorder or sometimes it's variety of dra well known drugs like amiodarone methotrexate nitrofurantoin or statins but uh, in with the connective tissue disorders uh, the nsip pattern is very common so one american study showing that they have done 22 lung biopsies in patients with dermatomyositis and polymyositis and 18 out of 22 become non specific interstitial new so uh, the hrct is the preferred uh, diagnostic tool uh, to identify the pattern of the nsip and the normal pa the cellular pattern is can be a bibasal ground glass appearance with some subfluorous sparing but uh, reticular changes and uh, traction bronchiectasis will come with the fibrotic process and the hrct features of the uh, primary and the secondary nsips are very similar and the good thing is it has good uh, management options so uh, we for the mild cases we can uh, remove the offending medications if you are suspecting a drug induced ild uh, for the moderate and severe cases we can treat with systemic glucocorticoids and immunosuppressants with biologics so, and maybe with some antifibrotics uh, so uh, for the dermatomyositis and polymyositis associated ilds uh, the interstitial lung disease is the one of the major cause for the respiratory distress uh, among the other causes for the respiratory uh, problems and uh, the prevalence uh, it range from 20 to 80% among k series and uh, with the presence of anti synthetase antibodies such as anti jo1 or anti mda5 antibodies like uh, anti melanoma differentiation uh, antibody 5 uh, there is a high chance to have a interstitial lung disease uh, in evidence uh, a study uh, done in a 90 patients uh, who having diabetes uh, dermatomyositis or polymyositis with the presence of anti jo1 uh, the 86% uh, short uh, feature uh, evidence of interstitial lung disease and another study uh, 15 of clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis patients almost all the patients uh, finally go to a interstitial lung disease but the interesting finding is uh, but interstitial lung disease is uh, less common uh, when uh, the polymyositis or dermatomyositis associated with the malignancy so the patterns can be uh, nsip op uip or diffuse alveolar damage pattern Uh, and the uh, the most important thing is the temporal relationship between the onset of ild and the myositis sometimes uh, the interstitial lung disease is the first manifestation 
so uh, the myositis come after months to years of time sometimes it appears simultaneously sometimes it develop after the muscle disease and uh, like in our patient sometimes ild appear with the absence of any any muscle symptoms so uh, this entity we call clinically amyopathic uh, variant uh, and uh, we have to consider uh, in some specific subsets like uh, antisynthetase syndromes or some clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis because these uh, entities mostly associated with uh, anti jo1 and anti mdfi antibodies and uh, they lead to some rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease and which are resistant to conventional therapy and having some very poor prognosis and sometimes this dermatomyositis and polymyositis overlap with other connective tissue disorders like sle cystic scler systemic sclerosis or uh, other connective tissue disorders so uh, so few words of uh, antisynthetase syndrome so there are some uh, separate clinical uh, features like uh, patient having some fever or not phenomena and characteristics mechanics hands Uh, so uh, and non erosive arthritis present with the interstitial lung disease and myositis with the association of anti jo1 positive and uh, these kind of patients uh, uh, most of the patients will end up end up with the interstitial lung disease uh, so this is a very simple diagram we used to uh, identify different uh, manifestations of dermatomyositis Uh, here, uh, so you can see in the classical dermatomyositis, there is a both muscle involvement and skin involvement is there. So patient having some classical cutaneous manifestations and uh, classical uh, proximal myopathy with some objective evidence of muscle involvement with EMG, muscle biopsy, and the MRI. But in the amyopathic variant, there is only cutaneous manifestation and uh, there is Uh, absence of muscle involvement in the hypermyopathic dermatomyositis uh, there is a obvious skin involvement but very minimal uh, muscle involvement so patient uh, doesn't show any uh, symptoms but there may be some elevated muscle enzymes or any uh, features in the uh, muscle biopsy or emg uh, with some myositis so this is uh, again the uh, same uh, description with the table form so uh, the other variant is a melanoma differentiation associated uh, gene 5 antibodies so as i mentioned it is very rapidly progressive cause of ild uh, the frequency is similar among the uh, classical patients and the clinically amyopathic variants and uh, prognosis is very poor so uh, evaluation mainly uh, normally we done with the clinical presentation chest imaging and the pulmonary function test but uh, if the diagnosis is doubtful then we can go with the lung biopsy but no, usually not it is not necessary and in the bronchoscopy there is very limited uh, value so we have normally used this for uh, exclude any infections and other differentials so in our when move into the our patient so uh, with this clinical picture so we are thinking this patient having very rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease with uh, without any significant muscle or cutaneous involvement but muscle biopsy suggest of dermatomyositis uh, and uh, so we are thinking and the anti jo is negative so we thinking this may be a case of anti mdfi associated ild predominant hypermyopathic dermatomyositis so uh, quickly go to the treatment options so for the asymptomatic patients uh, then uh, there is not require any specific therapy uh, if each patient is asymptomatic or any uh, there is any slowly progressive course but uh, a patients uh, with some significant respiratory involvement uh, like in our patient uh, the immunosuppressants are indicated but we have to uh, exclude infections and malignancy before starting of immunosuppression so again uh, the options uh, will change according to the pattern so the uh, initial treatment we have to start with prednisolone so if there is any rapid progressive involvement we can go with pulse uh, so if the depend on the response uh, the duration may be around 4 to 6 month but it will vary with the clinical entity 
and we have if there is any rapidly progressive pneumonitis we have to start a second line agent along with prednisolone so the second agent can be a azathioprine mmf or methotrexate or tacrolimus or cyclosporine uh, so uh, as well as so we can use some cyclophosphamide as so back to our patient so the patient uh, persistently showing uh, clinical deterioration uh, with exertional desaturation Uh, so she is not respond to the steroid pulses then proceed with the cyclophosphamide pulses but uh, we couldn't find any uh, good response so uh, then uh, we had to go with the our uh, uh, iv rituximab uh, it's a b, b cell depleting monoclonal antibody uh, thinking of this may be a persistent uh, case of a connective tissue disorder so we have given two uh, rituximab doses while patient on rituximab doses we proceed with the uh, radiological evaluation and you can appreciate there is now uh, worsening of the radiological features and there is some fibrotic elements as well so now we are in a therapeutic challenge so now we have a resistant disease to all conventional therapies so what will be the next option so uh, whether we can go ahead with a lung biopsy but patient she is not stable for go with a lung biopsy and uh, whether we can go for a intravenous immunoglobulin so ivig is a, another good option uh, normally we used uh, after if the rituximab is failed and there are some studies showing some promising results with the ivig but uh, and lung transplantation is bit uh, probable it is not practical with the, our setting so uh, in the second uh, mdt meeting uh, we discussed and uh, decided to go with the new drug uh, as a treatment so that is uh, janus kinase inhibitors uh, so example we have used we used the tofacitinib so it is initially developed for treating for neoplastic disorders but uh, most of the studies showing some promising results uh, to treat uh, with some resistant connective tissue disorders so mainly it involved in a signal uh, transduction uh, in between the nucleus and uh, interleukin uh, receptors in the plasma membrane so it uh, interrupt the inflammation and the uh, thing uh, which is uh, uh, favor to this drug uh, from the biologics are it is the administration is mainly orally Uh, and the uh, safety profile is very similar to the biologic so uh, there is risk of uh, having uh, reactivation of tb and uh, there may be some liver function uh, there may be having some liver function abnormalities uh, so and uh, there are some interesting articles in the literature uh, so in 2019 there is a, a interesting article showing uh, that uh, they have uh, given uh, 18 patients with uh, dermatomyositis with uh, anti mdfi associated uh, antibodies uh, with they have treated with tofacitinib with uh, along with the prednisolone and uh, they uh, compare this group uh, with uh, 32 patients of uh, uh, conventional uh, therapy so uh, according to their results uh, Uh, with the survival six months survival and the decline of from the fbc and dlco and uh, other than that the radiological uh, improvement uh, from the all aspects uh, the janus kinase inhibitors showing some uh, statistically significant results when compared to the conventional therapy so and there are a lot of uh, case reports and case series Uh, regarding uh, this uh, therapy uh, associated uh, for uh, patients with uh, clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis uh, so uh, we have started tofacitinib in uh, in this patient and uh, after the time so patient show some good uh, clinical and physiological response and uh, we uh, patient uh, because patient was not stable to arrange lung pulmonary function test so we managed to uh, monitor the patient with the uh, exertional desaturation so uh, finally uh, the, there is a resting saturation stabilized around 93 and uh, there is a improvement in the exertional distance and there is some uh, improvement in the exertional desaturation 
and uh, so we managed to uh, tail off the continuous oxygen and we uh, move into the short burst oxygen and uh, we continued the jack inhibitors while tailing off the steroids and while continuing pcp prophylaxis but the story uh, didn't come to the end and uh, after few weeks like 10 days following the treatment patient again developed fever but this time the respiratory symptoms are very minimal and then there were new symptoms like headache and neck pain and again with the basic investigations chest x ray showing some new shadows in the upper lobes and sputum afb this time become positive and uh, patient has underwent a uh, mri for some time ago and it was normal but the second mri with the with this history of headache uh, showing some there are some dispersed uh, hyper intensity uh, lesions Uh, which are radiologically suggestive of tuberculomas and CSF also showing some high protein with lymphocytosis suggestive of a disseminated TB. So now uh, we had another challenge. So now patient, uh, we manage with the ILD part, now, but now patient present with the opportunistic infection. So we had to start uh, anti-TB treatment while keeping uh, with minimum dose of immunosuppressants. But uh, this patient uh, is very susceptible to having a reactivation of TB because uh, these JAK uh, mutation inhibitors are very potent drugs for the TB reactivations compared to the other drugs. But uh, and she is a healthcare worker in a TB prevalent country, and anyway she is she was on with a lot of immunosuppressants with the uh, advanced lung disease. Anyway, with the treatment, uh, she has improved uh, the head and uh, fever and headache was improved, and uh, we managed to uh, discharge the patient uh, with the follow-up of uh, medical respiratory rheumatology and neurology units. But uh, outcome-wise, uh, the problem was uh, finally she uh, we had a loss. her follow up because she was there for 3 months uh, with the, this initial evaluation and uh, we managed her interstitial lung disease parts and opportunistic infection but unfortunately uh, there was a uh, lost in follow up of this patient so uh, in the uh, in the end, end of my presentation so i would like to go with some take home points uh, uh, so interstitial lung disease uh, associated with the uh, Uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis which is a major cause for morbidity and mortality with this disease entity and uh, it is specially uh, when the uh, disease entity associated with the anti mdfio anti jo1 antibodies and uh, when you are thinking of nsip or any uh, connective tissue uh, lung involvement in a patient with a uh, connective tissue disorder you have to think of some opportunistic infections and drug induced uh, pneumonitis as well and uh, for the diagnostic and therapeutic challenging lung conditions uh, we should always go with the multidisciplinary approach and regular assessment of patients with ctd ildd is very important because uh, to analyze the response for the treatment and to detect new clinical conditions and identify uh, disease and treatment related complications so these are my references uh, and thank you very much for the kind full listening Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chandramal. Now we are moving to the final presentation, and that's about the place of lung functions in a CTD and ILD, presented by Dr. Dilisha Vadhe Singh Lila Ratnagi, who is a consultant respiratory physician and also a lecturer in physiology. What you know? What I will be talking about is the place of lung functions in CTD, ILD. So. thank you uh, what i will what i will go through through this uh, half an hour would be the respiratory physiology briefly of ild at rest and then during exercise and also then i will focus on a few lung function tests which are basically the uh, diffusion capacity the dlco fvc and as well as the 6 minute walk test in um, lung uh, connective tissue disease ild right so when you're talking about the res uh, resting respiratory physiology in ild the commonest pattern you would see is a restrictive defect where you would see a decrease in the fev1 fvc and as well as the ratio would be either normal or increased because of the proportionate decrease the 
um, it is the typical pattern what we see, and this is due to uh, reduced com lung compliance and increased recoil pressure of the lungs. Because it is restrictive lung disease, you would see a reduction in the static lung volumes and the total lung capacity. Also, gas exchange is impaired in um, CTD ILD as well as in any ILDs, and it is mainly due to the ventilation perfusion, perfusion mismatch, and also diffusion limitation also would contribute. So, the, the how we measure it is the single breath DLCO test. It is a negative prognostic factor, and also it would reflect the degree of diffusion limitation and also the severity of the pulmonary vascular insufficiency. So DLCO would not tell you only about the interstitial involvement, it will tell you about the vascular involvement as well. And then you would see changes in the resting blood gas abnormalities towards the latter, uh, the, towards the end stage of the disease, where you would see resting hypoxemia, and also there would be an increase in the alveolar arterial oxygen tension. When we talk about exercise, the changes in physiology in exercise, what you saw in at rest would all be intensified in exercise. And then exercise testing would give you additional information for the reason why your patient is having exertional dyspnea. So why, whether is it due to altered respiratory mechanics, such as rapid and shallow breathing pattern, uh, or is it due to impaired gas exchange? Is it a cardiovascular abnormal because connective tissue diseases can affect other organs as well? So is it a cardiovascular abnormality or is it a peripheral muscle dysfunction due to disuse, which is very common in patients with connective tissue diseases and also other uh, in stage lung diseases. So in this uh, graph, you would see that the uh, this is the vital capacity, and then you would see normal tidal breaths. Once you start exercising in a normal healthy person, the tidal volume would increase as well as the respiratory frequency to increase the, uh, to uh, obtain the extra ventilation, re ventilatory requirements. But then, in ILD, because it's a restrictive disease, in a spirometry, you would see that the lung function tests the would be all would be low. So your volumes would be low, your tidal volume would be low, your inspiratory capacity would be low. And when we look at the pressure, these are the compliance curves. When you look at the compliance curve, you can see that. This is uh, in the normal person, the steepness of the slope would show what your lung compliance. That means how distensible your lungs are. And in the in ILD, you would see that the slope is flattened. So this means that the lung compliance is reduced. And then the black dot here shows your tidal volume at rest and your tidal volume at rest in ILD. And then your the uh, the hollow loop shows the uh, tidal volume in exercise. So you can clearly see that the tidal volume in exercise in ILD is less than the tidal volume in exercise in a normal person. Also, the inspiratory capacity is low and the total lung capacity you can see is low here as well. So why, do, why can't you increase your tidal volume? Because you are asking your patient to increase the tidal volume while they are having a stiff lung, which is small in size. So you will not be able to gain the expected um, tidal volume. So therefore, you will have a very small tidal volume increase only. So basically, they would increase their ventilation, lung ventilation by increasing their respiratory frequency. So they, they will breathe short and shallow, shallow rapid breaths. So this would increase the dead, dead space ventilation rather than alveolar ventilation. So your breathing won't be very effective and your exercise capacity would reduce in these patients. Right. So what is the importance of lung functions in these patients? 
So it is useful for us to establish the diagnosis and the, uh, to assess the severity at diagnosis. And then you can use these lung functions to monitor disease progression and then to assess the response to treatment of the group whom you put on treatment. And also you can use this to estimate the prognosis of patients uh, of, who are having CTD, ILD. To mention one fact is that most of the literature data is on ILD and CTD ILD literature is very minimum and the disease entity which is mostly studied is systemic sclerosis ILD. Right, okay. So what can you see in lung functions? You would see the typical fu lung function test would be a restrictive pattern with reduced DLCO. And also your lung function test would indicate uh, as, uh, or will hint towards a differential diagnosis sometimes as well. So if you see a mixed obstructive and a restrictive pattern, it could be either a disease which would which would have a um, mixed obstructive or restrictive pattern such as in the vasculitis, or it could be a disease entity where the COPD or obstructive lung disease such as COPD or asthma are coexisting with ILD. So your lung functions would be very important to tell whether it is uh, PO, it will give a basic idea actually about whether it is POILD or whether there is something else hidden in the diagnosis. And also remember to uh, identify a restrictive pattern, the spirometry is not sufficient. So spirometry would tell you whether you have a restrictive pattern or not, but to tell that it is a definite restrictive defect, you will have to do a full lung function where you would um, assess the lung volumes as well. And then it would tell you whether there is any mixed pattern as well. And then you would, once you would find this um, patient with ILD, you diagnose with, with HRCT criteria, and then you do a lung function and you would find that the lung functions are preserved. So this could be seen in early disease where you would see a decrease in DLCO, but then your lung functions would be, your spirometry would be normal or the lung volumes might be normal as well. But then when you look at your CT and it is extensive disease, then you can think, could this be combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema as well? So why this group is important is because this group has a very high prevalence of pulmonary hypertension. So we should not miss this group of patients in our cohort. And then you, I would we would recommend that you should do a baseline DLCO in um, all the patients with ILD because at baseline, if your DLCO is found to be less than 40% of the predicted value, it is associated with very increased risk of death. And also it is sensitive than FEC, but not very specific. So that is why most of the studies use FEC rather than using DLCO. Okay, so what, what, are, what can we, um, how can we use the lung function test to estimate the prognosis of patients? So this is one of the studies which had which was published and used extensively by the experts in um, ILD. Uh, and what they did was they looked at the, uh, they tried to divide the patient into limited disease and extensive disease use combining the CT findings and the lung function findings. So, the, they estimated the extent of fibrosis using the uh, CT. If it was less than 10%, it was classified as limited disease. If it was above 30%, then they classified it as extensive disease. And then they looked at the lung functions in the intermediate group. And this group was again classified into limited and extensive disease based on their FVC values. If the FVC was reduced to less than 70% of predicted values, it was extensive and if it was above or more than 70% predicted, it was limited disease. So the, the, the researchers found that um, the difference in this, um, the limited disease and extensive disease was very, the survival was significantly different. So com in combination um, of the 
HRCT and lung function finding, according to the graph shown in the bottom, it, which it shows that the predictive capability is increased uh, rather than using either CT or lung functions on their own. So the current trend is to combine these lung functions with uh, CT findings and also to combine various lung function abnormalities to give a better prognostic indication. So what are we going to monitor in our patients? So when the disease is very severe, it is very easy for the, the treatment for decision is very easy, it is straightforward. But then it is a challenge when the, um, in mild cases where we should we treat or should we not treat. So here the importance of longitudinal behavior monitoring is very important. So you should monitor your patient's lung functions, CT findings, as well as the patient's symptoms, very importantly, the symptoms as well but because we are focusing on lung functions in this lecture I have only mentioned lung functions so basically it would be at baseline do a fec total lung capacity dlco a six minute walk distance and the desaturation during exercise and then you can monitor them serially so many um, guidelines would suggest whether three to six months is what they have suggested so if your patient is having severe symptoms rapid deterioration of symptoms so maybe you can monitor them every three months with lung functions and the uh, six minute walk distance or then or either you can use six months for monitoring depending on how you feel your patient would behave because CTGILD behavior is very different from patient to patient. So why force vital capacity? So because it is specific for the interstitium and while DLCO is also reflecting the abnormalities in vasculature. It is variable, this variable uh, is most constantly reflecting the changes in SSILD clinical trials and it is widely validated. It's not only in SSILDs but also in other interstitial lung diseases also. FEC is the value what they have used, used. But the reason is not very clearly mentioned in any of the literature uh, for until now. And um, it is more repeatable uh, than um, DLCO, so could be the reason why. And also I would like to mention that the scleroderma lung study, which happened in 2000, which was published in 2006, would have been one reason why, or why the FEC was more um, favored uh, after 2006, as shown in the graph here. So you'd see after 2006, there's a rapid inc increase in the using of FVC percentage predicted rather than the DLCO increase. And this is because in the scleroderma lung study, FVC increase was uh, more prominent and only the, there was only a modest increase in the DLCO with treatment. So uh, it was not favored much after but I would like to tell that DLCO, which is an underutilized, underrecognized test, is very important in ILD patients. Why? It is help. It will help. Is help you to determine the severity of ILD. If your uh, DLCO less than forty percent at onset or at some point, you should consider referring a patient for transplant assessment if they are. Um, if, if the patients are affordable, I know that we don't have lung transplant in Sri Lanka, but uh, I hope for the best and we hope that it will come. DLCO would be important uh, in assessing your patient's condition. Right. So uh, what if the FEC, now we've talked, talk, talked about um, this, right? Okay, so what is significant lung uh, change in lung function? Right, so what we the ATS ERS guidelines would suggest is what the ATS ERS guidelines would suggest is that a significant decline in lung function is a decline in FEC more than 10% uh, or a decline in DLCO by more than 15% within 6 to 12 months. It is associated with increased risk of death and uh, decline in FEC, which is uh, if more than 15% would show a 99% chance that it is a real decline. And 
Also, there are studies showing that a decline in DLCO more than 22.5% uh, from baseline would suggest that there is a 99% chance of real decline. So what if your patient has a decline between 5 and 10%? So these are very common scenarios what we see and encounter when we are seeing a treating patient. So decline is not more than 10%, but it's between 5 and 10%. So what you should do is look at the other lung function tests. You can see, look at your DLCO. Is your DLCO going down? Look at the patient's symptoms. Are uh, they worse, getting worsening? So if so, your patient would be having progressive lung disease. But if the worsening is marginal in other factors as well, you can continue to observe these patients. So there are studies where they have used the composite categorical thresholds where either decline in FEC more than 10% or decline in FEC five to 10, between five to 10% combined with the DLCO decline more than 15% shows that there is a, a statistically significant uh, survival benefit survival indication or prognostic indication indication using either lung function values as well right so when you're moving to the exercise testing what is available in sri lanka uh, common uh, not commonly um, easily or feasibly is the six minute walk distance but then we have other exercise modalities which i will tell about later which would be better and it's um, available in sri lanka recently as well so six minute walk test is also an underutilized te uh, test but it would provide a, a functional measurement of the patient's overall cardiopulmonary reserve it will not tell you which system is affected whether it's lung or heart or whether it's a muscle but it will give you an overall picture of your cardiopulmonary reserve and then also you can pick the patients who are having oxygen desaturation with exercise before they develop the desaturation at rest so this test you can use to justify the supplemental oxygen usage or prescription for these patients for clinical as well as physiological needs because uh, hypoxia can increase the pulmonary pressures pulmonary arterial pressures leading to pulmonary hypertension so catching them early putting them on oxygen can prevent development of pulmonary hypertension in these patients so the six minute walk distance uh, is a strong predictor of mortality and it correlates with the measure, measures of lung function and the quality of life as well. What is the limitation in six minute walk test is the, uh, the, the comorbidities that affect the ability to uh, walk would be a limiting factor in getting the proper six minute walk distance in these patients because they have problems with the connective tissue. So they would have problems with walking uh, or mobilizing to get the correct evaluation of their cardiopulmonary reserve. So in studies which looks at six minute walk distance in IPS shows that a decline in the baseline six minute walk distance less than 250 meters is associated with the 2.565 fold increase in risk of mortality and a decline in the distance more than 50 meters within six months would associate with an increased mortality again. So monitoring your six minute walk distance is very important. Also looking for desaturation on exercise is important. So why I say that is patients who are having a rapid decline despite being on treatment and optimal medical management, which indicate which are indicated by a 10% or greater decri decline in their host vital capacity or a for, uh, DLCO of less than 40% with a clinical deterioration or greater uh, than 15% decline DLC over 50, six months would qualify for transplant assessment. So these are the most severe patients who have poor prognostic features. And then a rapid decrease in pulse oximetry below 88% during a six minute walk test is also a poor prognostic feature. So these patients' survival can improve if you care, have a do uh, do a careful selection as well as address esophageal dysfunction, which is also 
very detrimental to the lung functions of patients with CGD ILD. So finally, the cardiopulmonary exercise testing would give us a better indication of what system is abnormal or what is the reason for your patient's exercise dyspnea, exertional dyspnea, whether it is a problem with your lung disease, whether it's a problem with your cardiovascular disease, or whether it is poor um, patients with poor muscular functions. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, ILD, uh, despite the promising treatment methods, is still a disease of poor prognosis. And you should monitor the lung function change, patient symptom change, as well as the CT findings for the lung functions. Do uh, at least monitor the uh, spirometry, DLCO, and the six-minute walk distance maybe every six months or three months monthly, depending on your patient's um, symptoms and symptom progression. And careful monitoring of these lung functions will help to uh, prognosticate your patient, assess the response to treatment, and also optimize treatment management. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dilisha, for that very informative presentation. Now we reach to the end of this clinical meeting which uh, discuss uh, important content related to an area that is uh, hardly discussed and uh, of a lot of in, uh, interest to the those who are in the field of pulmonology. And uh, if you have any clarifications, you can ask in the chat. Uh, at the moment, we haven't received any. Mm, if you want to ask any questions, you can do so. Uh, so far, we haven't got any questions. Uh, what we will do is we'll put this material in the way that we usually do. This will be converted into a video and then uh, put into the our social media and the YouTube so that others can visit and then learn from this material. And that will be available within next few days. So with that, I would like to conclude this session and thank the College of Pharmacologists of Sri Lanka and especially the three resource persons, that's Dr. Asha Samaranayaka, and Dr. LBN Chandramal and Dr. Dilisha Vadasingali Ratnagi for their excellent effort presentations. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand over the latest of appreciation for all three source persons. Thank you. Have a nice day.